Hello and welcome to the closing beat. Happy, happy Wednesday to you. Good, good. We're financial advisors here at Jazz Wealth. Hope you're having a good day out there. Uh, we got some nasty weather around here, so, uh, you know, it's wet, it's windy, it's rainy, but it's all blowing through as we speak. There's nothing they can blow away at my house. They already blew away the screen. They already blew away the roof. So, you know, who cares? Uh, anyways, we're financial advisors here at Jazz Wealth. Financial advisors for people who don't think they can have financial advisors. And to prove it, we have officially today uh, become the official financial services partner of Drum Corps International. Super excited about that. If you look on their website anywhere, you're going to start to see our cool new logo that we have. And, uh, oh, it's kind of it's right here. A little bit of it right on my shirt. Huh? It's fun. It's festive, right? It doesn't have to be stuffy and boring. We try to portray that in our shows and logos and images and stuff. But you guys are here to talk about the stock market, so let's do that. I'm going to go all over the place today. I mean, I don't know. I was like, I was trying to think of stuff to talk about all day. I was looking at the market, I was looking at information and it was just like puppies in a room. I was just going everywhere. I'm like, forget it. They're going to get everything here today. So let us dive in. All right. The S and P there's actually not much to mention here with the S and P. Uh, we talked about this at length, especially over the past couple of days, just drawing out how tight this pattern's getting inside of here and expecting the move to break one way or the other. And that has happened. The downside today, I would say, is I, I would have preferred if we were going to continue this uptrend, I would have preferred to see the market just grind up, just get going, right? Uh, sadly, it was a bit of a tug of war day. So I'm going to go over to the five minute uh, chart here, just to show you intraday. Uh, there you go. So a gap down this morning and then just this. I'm sorry, we're over here. There we go. A little attempt at a rally and then tug of war, 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 sell off at the end of the day, but it wasn't enough to go negative only for a brief moment. So there, there was no consistency there. You know what I mean? It, I would have preferred to see an attempt at a rally today um, that was consistent, maybe a trend day, something like that. And that would have caused people to um, sort of forget yesterday, you know? we would move on into Thursday and Friday. It was like, okay, it was just a blip on the screen. We're all wrong, we're, we're not going down, we're going up. We didn't see that today, so eh, that bothers me a little bit. What also bothers me is we're less than 1% off of highs. This is nothing. This is just the littlest, tiniest blip you've ever seen. So it's not really that interesting there, um, but we do have a deterioration of this tight uptrend. So that's all we can really say about this. Anybody that says like, oh, the market's gonna go down or higher or whatever, Okay, good guess, but there's nothing to go on. We're just sort of deteriorating, and that's probably the word that I would use. Now, we want a pullback, um, and yesterday I made a quick mention of that, and I said, you know, I didn't have the data. I got to go back, and I got to get the data there for you. So let's take a look. Um, we want a pullback because there's $1.6 trillion sitting in money market funds a to uh, that have been added th since 2023. I should say, I, I said that wrong. 1.6 trillion that's been added since 2023, total of 9 trillion sitting in money market funds. Now, a lot of that, to be honest, you can track this. You actually see it on the Fed's website. A lot of this came from existing bank accounts, right? So don't let me trick you there and, and try to say like money came out of the market and people are going and playing it safe. There is some of that, but a lot of this money, this 1.6 trillion was people that were like, hey, I've been holding 30 grand or 10 grand or 2,000 or whatever in my checking account because there's nowhere else for me to go. Now you're telling me I'm getting 5%, I'll go put it in a money market, right? So I do want to make that part clear. Nonetheless, what do we have? A slowing of money going into the stock market and more money going into savings, okay? We gotta convince those people. We, we gotta give them a reason to take some risk with that money. Not all of it, but some of it, right? So if the market pulls back, that's actually helpful. There's lots of money on the sidelines. There's lots of cash inside of mutual funds. Do you ever look at that? If you look at the prospectus of a, like a growth fund or something, they have, a, a man, they've gotta have it in there, that'll tell you like, we will at any point have no more than 10% cash. If it's a growth fund, usually it's 10%, right? And then you go, okay, well, how much cash do you have right now? A lot of them are right near 10%. So they've got money to put to work too. So when we look at the stock market here, a pullback is really warranted to get, let's go, let's do it again. Let's have another uptrend. So I'm all for it there. Also, uh, no, I'm, gonna, uh, I'm not going to do it. Let's go over here. We'll come back to that. Uh, you got the NASDAQ. Same thing, a deterioration of the uptrend there. Um, you've got the Dow down three days in a row, more of a decent pullback there. It's been a little bit more volatile than the rest of the markets there. It's still minimal, though, not a big deal. And really, it's kind of been a one-stock wonder type of a pullback. 
where we had the healthcare stock, uh, United Healthcare yesterday. Today it's Disney. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but on the flip side, you know, you got the bigger names, uh, Goldman Sachs, Caterpillar. They had good days, so it kind of offset the declines there. So the pullback in the Dow is also kind of meaningless at the moment, if I could say it that way. Uh, if you look at the Russell 2000, slight bounce today. Uh, what was weak yesterday in the Russell 2000? Got a little bit of a bounce today. It was just not enough. We didn't erase any of that, so not trying to say anything there. Uh, bonds also trying to move back towards the lower end of this downtrend. It started that. It's kind of a volatile day for bonds, both in the short term and the long term. And then crude oil, yeah, energy uh, was the second best performer here today. But uh, crude oil just continuing this nice little uptrend and more... Uh, well-defined uptrend, I should say. Um, now, a couple things. Uh, if you look over, we've done this in the past. If you look at the performance of the market by president and during election cycles, you know, it's pretty uniform. And right? so there's not much in the way of outliers. Now, Biden's had a different run. Biden's performance has gotten extended and away from the averages historically. Then it came back and went below the average. Now we're back above the average. So he's kind of had more of a I don't want to say a volatile ride, but compared to the average, yes, more of a volatile ride. If we look so far, let's see what is the seasonal trend historically of election years and non-election years as well. So check this out. Green, this is where we're at, 2024 year to date, right? We are ahead of schedule because in presidential uh, election years, we normally start with a rally and we get a little bit of a fade right after that New Year excitement. We have none of that, right? We're just straight up in any year is it normal, or would we say, is it seasonal, is it average for the market to just go whoop and just take off without any kind of pullback? No, in non-presidential years, in light blue there, uh, we still see a little bit of a pullback or more of a concentrated uptrend. Um, in presidential election years, we get more volatility, obviously, that, I mean, not surprising anybody there, but we are currently well above where we should be. So another reason why you may say, um, I would like to have a pullback here. I'll give you another one. Um, it, it's historically not um, good in the short term for the stock market to be at highs going into an earning season, right? Um, we see underperformance then. And think about it. It's just that the market's so strong. Everybody's so excited. Earnings are coming up. Oh, my God, it's going to be great. Well, if one thing's wrong, oh, well, wait a minute. Why are we paying for perfection up here in the stock market if earnings are so-so? Right? So I thought we'd take a little bit of a look at that. I told you, we're going all over the place. Hang with me. Here is every single analyst at, in the total consensus of earnings coming up by sector and for the S&P, just so you know. If you are curious, the S&P, we're expecting 4% growth. Okay, Where does that come from? Surprisingly, 24% growth in utilities, that's the expectation there. Communication services, which was your leading sector here today, 22%. Work your way down. We're expecting the excitement in energy to slow a little bit. Guidance will be key for energy because now oil prices, hey, they're helping us out there. So we're not, we're not realizing those profits just at the moment. But we, uh, you know, going forward, right, we might be able to do that. So guidance will be key. Also, energy is looking for a Republican win in the White House. So that's going to become more important as well. Energy, coal, you know, fossil fuels and stuff, they all do better under a Republican-led uh, president and preferably Republican-controlled Congress as well. I don't think that's going to happen this go-around, but, you know, that, that's what energy is looking for. So a lot of volatility coming in there. Nonetheless, we're expecting a decline, uh, a slight decline in um, earnings growth there for uh, the energy sector. Just wanted to put that around there. And then we threw in how the, I saw it on TV, they've been doing this a lot. X financials and utilities, we got 3% earnings growth. X energy, we got 7% growth. Uh, and then, you know, they have their things. So I just put each one in there that, that they do there. Now, a lot of focus is going to be on the Magnificent Seven. Well, there's something called earnings revisions. Okay. So we're going to do a little earnings talk here. So what, what tends to happen is we have uh, analysts have earnings expectations for this quarter, this next quarter, so on and so on. They tend to go out one year. So they're sort of making their predictions then and then they you know, see how it all goes. They adjust. They call those adjustments revisions. So as things get closer, they go, ah, we thought you were going to do this much. We're going to revise that down or revise it up, right? So with that, we take a look at the earnings revisions of the Magnificent Seven. What you see in the S&P in the dark blue line is as a whole, 
the uh, revisions for this upcoming earnings uh, season has slightly risen. In other words, they feel like they've set the bar too low. After all the information that's come in much closer to earnings, we now realize that earnings are probably going to be a little bit better than expected previously. Not better, just better than expected, right? So careful there with those words. Well, one thing that we notice here is the Magnificent Seven, the earnings revisions are now flat. In other words, they're saying there is so much growth baked into these guys here. How could we assume that we need to bake in more growth, right? A great example would be, and a way to show this example, would be NVIDIA. So dark blue here, these are the current expectations for NVIDIA. So for example, we've got this upcoming earnings right here. Uh, fitting inside of this. And right now we're expecting 79% growth in their earnings. That's a lot. <laughs> I'll show you in a second why that is astronomical. Um, but nonetheless, if we look back last year at this time, we're expecting 24% growth. Okay. That's a revision to the upside. And naturally, NVIDIA has earned it, you know, the killing it. So this time last year, we're going, hey, NVIDIA, 24% growth. Now the forecast is for 79% growth. The bar has been raised. <laughs> I mean, just as high as it goes, right? I mean, it's just such a high expectation. If we don't get anywhere near that, NVIDIA's in big trouble there. So and then going forward, I should say, you have all the expectations going into 2025, 2026. This is where it stands, right? It's going to be revised. Then I just wanted to put in there what it was previously. Now, do you like NVIDIA, do you? Do you think it's uh, good times to come? I want to point out something. Um, the stock is what they would call fairly valued relative to the Magnificent Seven. Take the, the top, we will just take the top 10 stocks, right? And put them in a little basket and you go, it's basically fairly valued. You can say that one or two stand out, but basically it's fairly valued. Uh, maybe Tesla is undervalued at the moment. So we're expecting double digit growth from NVIDIA. This is for all the NVIDIA fans out there. Ready? If you're expecting double digit growth, we've had double digit growth. How long can that go? Is it normal for stocks to have uh, greater than 20% earnings growth? Is it normal for stocks to have greater than 10% earnings growth year after year after year? You wanna know something? There's actually only one stock that 10 years in a row had double digit earnings growth. I mean, oh, I'm sorry, over 20% earnings growth. Uh, I will do an honorary. Um, uh, just a player of the, what do you call it? Not player of the week. I'll do a uh, pretend guess the Dow winner, $100 e-gift card if somebody can type in the uh, what stock has had 20% or greater earnings growth 10 straight years. There's only one in the S&P. I'll even give you that. It's in the S&P. Go ahead. Give you your guess there and we'll see what happens. But, uh, oh, is it on a slide? I'll make sure I didn't put it on a slide before I show you. No, it's not. Okay. So check this out. If you're looking inside the S&P, don't let this, this is a weird chart. This is the only way to do this. Okay, so let's start with 10% sales growth. All right, light blue line. How many companies in the S&P have done that one time? 91% of them. Great, that makes perfect sense, right? You don't get in the S&P if you're a slacker, right? How many companies have done it two years in a row? Only 77%. I just to say only, that's impressive still. Three years in a row, rapid decline down to 55%. Four years, five years, blah, 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 blah. You get 10 years out, you only have 11% of S&P companies ever in history, whether they're still around or not, this is every piece of data, uh, that have had over 10% sales growth for 10 straight years. It's difficult, right? But NVIDIA, oh, we're projecting that it always has double-digit sales growth. It's just not going to happen, right? So let's say uh, NVIDIA now is the standout here. You know, oh, my God, look at the 79% sales growth. This is crazy. How many companies have done over 20% sales growth in one year? 72%. Still rather impressive. Look how quick it drops. 20% sales growth two years in a row, 43%. Some of that's from the dot-com era, too. Three years in a row, 23%. Oh, my God, work your way down to a 10-year, an investment. You're investing in something that you expect sales growth to continue. 3% of any and all S&P companies, both now and in the past, have ever been able to do 20% or greater sales growth year after year after year for 10 straight years. It's very, very difficult to do that. There's only one company that's done it. And if the stream, as the stream catches up, let's see if it, and no one, zero people have got it. Great guesses, because you got to go with some of the obvious, right? Zero. No, 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 no. 
I, I do like some of the guesses, though. So uh doesn't appear that anybody's going to get it. Remind me, I, I'm going to give more time for this to guess, but remind me if, if to not leave without saying it. I've, I've done that in the past. <laughs> All right, so uh, let's do some stocks in the news while you guys continue to guess on that one. Not a lot, uh, not much to pick on here. Uh, you got Calmain, they make eggs uh, for your grocery store and all that good stuff. Uh, Calmain, um, better than expected earnings. Um, they are doing something different here. Uh, they're going to do a one time, like Costco does, is, you know, big one time special dividend. They're going to go with a dollar. Um, they're not as big as Costco and stuff, so you kind of understand that. But that was part of the excitement today. Uh, Disney, Elon Musk said, to, hey, if uh, Nelson Peltz gets to be on the board, um, I would buy some Disney stock. That was Elon Musk saying that. Well, that's not going to happen. Uh, he's he's not going to be on the board there. Uh, kind of sad, uh, really, for what he was trying to do. But it's not going to happen. The existing board stays in place. And investors are like, oh, man. And that's why the stock was lower. They wanted some change. Uh, Dave and Buster's. Now, Dave and Buster's, by the way, um, missed on earnings. This was not a pleasant earnings report. Why is the stock higher? That's really interesting. Okay, I got the data for you here today. They, all the nastiness that they said. Less people going to play in games, less food, less smaller margins on the food and everything, shrinkflation, blah, blah, blah. Hey, we're going to buy back $100 million worth of our shares. Boop, 10% rally. Why is that? Refer to the chart. Here's an updated version. We are here in the economic cycle. When you are in this portion of the economic cycle, the investors that will buy your stock, they will reward you for returning cash to shareholders and strengthening your balance sheet. They will not reward you for buying other companies, expanding your company, hiring more people, blah, blah, blah. So, and really I should say it this way, the stocks that outperform during this portion in the economic cycle are these, right? So refer to the uh, sheet. I've shared that with you guys uh, quite a bit there. And every single time you can see it, you can see it, you can see it. Hey, Signet Jewelers here uh, taking a different approach, right? They did raise their guidance going forward, but they said, hey, we're going to buy back shares. It's just we're going to start with the preferred shares that we have out there. So we refer to this. We are here. We are returning cash to some shareholders. I'll, I'll give you a pass on that one. Uh, you're going to outperform. Okay. Uh, yes, we're going to outperform. There you go. Up 10% as well. So both stocks today that reported buying back shares enjoyed a 10% gain. Tomorrow you got ConAgra Foods and Lamb Weston. Uh, as I look through the names here, I am looking for one name in particular who has had double digit, I'm sorry, over 20% sales growth for 10 years. The only company in the S&P that's ever done it. No one officially have guessed it, and that's why I felt confident offering the $100 bet there. The answer is ServiceNow. <laughs> right? Woo well, nobody looks at that one. The out of favor names that nobody's looking at. You got to look through these here. We haven't owned it. ServiceNow actually is the answer. The only company to ever, ever do that. Shows you how rare it is. That's why we bounced around a lot here today. Because I wanted to show you that, number one, there's a lot more things you can look at than just like, do you think that stock's going higher or lower? There's a lot we can look at to play offense. And then hopefully we get to play a little defense as well. There it is. If you have any questions, I'm happy to take your questions, although I'm sorry that no one got the right answer there. Otherwise, if you'd like to learn about the basics so that some of this more geeky stuff uh, rings home to you, check out Haley's channel, Dough Straight, on uh, YouTube there. She's doing little bite-sized, simple, and beginner-type topics so that you can get your dough straight. What happened? Something happened on the screen. Was that purple thing? That's her thing? Hit me with it again. Let me see what that looks like. We got something on there for, hey, I like it. All right. I like it. I like it. Uh, great trivia here today. There you go. Yeah. And not a teaser. I'm glad I remember to do it. There was some one time in the past I had said like, okay, what's the answer? And then I just left. And I just thought the show was over and everybody's like, well, what was the answer? Dude. Uh, so I'm glad I didn't do that to you. Okay. There's no need to guess anymore. Right. <laughs> we, we, we know what's going on there. Uh, let me go back to some of the questions that maybe got washed away there, like uh, Steve's question. How about shorting Kroger? You'd mentioned it tends to lose its gains after its earnings. With the earnings came out, though, I was, and we were talking about earnings day. 
So for example, well, let's make sure we didn't mess that up because I don't want to misguide uh, anybody here. So for example, ConAgra. Uh, so tomorrow they'll report earnings. Four of the last eight earnings reports, the stock has traded lower. That doesn't tell you a lot, right? Because it's 50-50. So let's use Lamb Weston. Lamb Weston, when I say things like this, I'm talking about that day. Lamb Weston, ticker symbol LW, um, seven of the last eight earnings report, the stock, on the day of earnings, the stock has responded positively. N nothing about going forward there. So Kroger already had their earnings. That's all done there. Um, I do agree that it's very extended and with a deteriorating market. You may have some relative weakness on your side there. Could that be? I don't know. Mm-hmm. Blue Horseshoe loves service now. There you go. We should have movie day one day. People watch it. Uh, Dustin said, and Dustin, man, how you doing? I know the, uh, I know we had the insurance guy a little while ago, but are any net worth slash umbrella policy videos in the dojo? They're talking about you, Chris. Do you want to talk about umbrella policies that may help as it revolves around your net worth to some clients? He says he can do that calmly, confidently, and focused. He can do it. Okay, Dustin, coming your way then. Uh, we'll do a, like a wine and wealth, me and you. You can teach me too, because it's not my thing. You're going to be great. Uh, for a down payment on a house, which would be better? Uh, oh, for a down payment on a house, which would be better? Taking a 401k loan, withdrawing from an IRA, or sell some stock? C, sell some stock, right? When, that's like, no, don't take from your IRA to buy a home. Although you can, and I know there are the rule says you're allowed to do it. You could be 35 years old, take $10,000 out of your IRA and not pay the penalty so long as you're buying your first time home and a first time home counts as a home that you have not, or you have not had a primary residence for two years. Um, but selling some stock is the way to go here. And I, you know, I'm, I guess I'm giving advice. I don't mean I'm, you're giving me a, a test question. So we're going to answer it like a test question. Um, selling stock means you have liquid cash. You probably are doing pretty well with everything doing so well here. So it may be an opportune time to sell some stock and it's early in the year. So if you sell some stock, you have a little bit of a capital gain there. Maybe the interest on your home will build up enough to where now you're itemizing your deductions and can try to write off some of that capital or gain off the interest that you'll pay on your house. If it were December, I might say something different, but that's a, a layered approach to maybe what you might look at. Plus, you don't want to pay taxes and penalties or have a loan out if you don't have to. You have options. All right. Dust, uh, Dustin Dodge says, thanks, Chris. Look forward to it, man. Yeah. It's kind of kind of on the hook now. Kind of kind of got to do it. Um, all right. Cool. Well, nice try on all the guesses there. But unfortunately, service now was the answer. We'll play another game another day. But I uh, wish you guys a great rest of your evening. And uh Enjoy. Eric joining you tomorrow for Wine and Wealth. Had a great topic. I was like, yep, you're up, man. Do it. Sounds good. So he'll be joining you for that. And if you want, schedule a call. Jazz Wealth, if you're not a client, you want to talk, uh, give us a call here. There's no sales pitch. We're not going to bite. We're very laid back and relaxed, but we'll see if you're a good fit to uh, start to get your dough straight. If so, happy to work with you. Enjoy. At Jazz Wealth, we treat you like family. That was going to be our slogan, but the employees here took it a little too seriously. You bought what? That wasn't in the plan that I built for you. Oh, quit crying. Don't spend one more dollar. I'm gonna start calling you Sylvester because you sound like a real- Tu siempre estás llorando como un bebé, lloroncito. I'm not mad, I'm just disappointed. That's how you get your identity stolen. We decided to go with let our family be your family's advisor.